name is Louise Dente, and I welcome you to yet another edition of Cultural Caravan. On this edition is a special as we're joined by uh, someone who basically is no stranger to me, but definitely new to many of you. His name is Ace Inzandi Hall, and he is a phenomenal performer, writer, actor, and uh, singer and just all around entertainer. Welcome to Cultural Caravan. I am so honored to be here. As my mother would call you, Sister Louise, I'm so honored to be here. I call you Queen Louise, so thanks for having me. You know, when we were talking about doing this, I had to say, wow, there's so many things you've done, but let me just, first of all, ask you to start by talking about who you are. Just give a brief uh, <laughs> overview of who you are uh, so the, for, for our audience. My full name, my birth name, and my father, Chris Asman D.C. Hall, gave me. Chris Asman D.C. Hall was one of the founders of AJAZ. I'm sure you've, you're you're quite familiar with that, with your, your wonderful documentary you did on AJAZ and the Black is Beautiful movement. That's my pops. And uh, my name is uh, Asman D.C. N. Zondi Hall. I go by a couple of stage names. Uh, my stage name in the entertainment industry is Ace Antonio Hall. And my pen name... Uh, for my novels and my my music is in Zandi, which is my real middle name. So just glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And you know, when we talk about the fact you're a native New Yorker, of course, yep. um, and grew up in Long Island, New York. Um, you also attended schools in Long Island, um, and I, I know that there was a period of your younger years that you were with your grandparents, but then you did grow up in terms of your uh, high school and other, and your college was in in New York. Um, what? actually led you to decide to leave an educational career <laughs> to pursue theater, excuse me, television and the arts? I was born actually in the Elmhurst Hospital where my mother worked as a nurse while we were living in uh, Bushwick in, in Brooklyn. So I always claimed Brooklyn. And uh, when I was a wee little fella, uh, my grandmother, my grandparents picked me up and took me to uh to live with them in Jacksonville, Florida. And I kind of lived back and forth from New York to Florida. So my elementary education and my high school years were in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, what led me to leave was I'd gotten married right after I graduated high school. And my, uh, you know, I, I only been married for five days and she passed away. And I was just torn apart and I thought it was ready to leave. It was time to leave Florida. So I went to New York to go to finish my college education just to get away from just everything was memories, bad memories. No, not bad memories, but, you know, uh, it just made me grieve even more. And so I left that, went back home. I thought it was time to kind of re-familiarize myself with my parents because I hadn't really spent a lot of time with them, my mother and my father. And went to school here in, uh, in, in New York in uh, LIU. So... As soon as I went to school and at LIU, I decided at that point they had a really great communications program, a film department, and uh, I decided, you know what, I want I want to go into entertainment. Um, I want you know I want to direct, I want to write, you know I want to write for films and TV, and so that's what I got my education in. So it kind of was like out of the grieving period, it led me more to my creative side. I needed to express myself, and that's particularly why I chose that career or uh, that, you know, education path. So again, being going into uh, education and then somehow deciding at some point in your career that you wanted something different. Yeah. At what point did you realize that that wasn't enough? I was in education for about 13 or 14 years. I started from the bottom from as a substitute teacher, but I was never the type of substitute teacher to pass out crossword puzzles <laughs> i wanted you know i just i i'd heard a man say people don't know or people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and from that very first moment every time i met a student i needed them to know how much i cared about their future just something that was inside me maybe because my grandmother taught school for 44 years and was an educator maybe that was in me and as a as a as a substitute teacher and then a permanent sub I actually took the books home the textbooks home, learned what I needed to teach them in the curriculum and taught them. 
And I was really good at uh, managing the classroom because I had some tough classes and I was good at managing the classroom. So that's what I did. And I didn't particularly love doing it, but I loved being able to give students and the youth a chance to broaden their lives and have better lives. That's what, what I was really passionate about, you know, doing something for them and leading them to a way. I have so many stories. That could be another another time of the things that I did in the classroom that really helped the kids, you know, move forward and learn and, and, and just get past a lot of the stuff that they had in their communities. But as far as my love, you know, when I got really far into, into education, I was a director first in New York, the New York Board of Education. I was director at uh, IS-231 of an school program. And then I moved to Los Angeles and I became uh, the associate director of education for the Civil Learning Center. You might as well say I was, might as well say I was the center director there because I led the meetings there. I mean, I did a lot. Of, I did way beyond what my, you know, my job title had asked me to do. And uh, the void was because I am a creative and anyone who's a creative knows that you can't, there's nothing you can do about it. You sleep about writing songs or stories. Your characters talk to you in your head. People think you're crazy. You see a news headline and you and you and a story pops in your mind and there's nothing you can do about it. And so because I wasn't doing that, there was this hole. There was a sadness in me, you know, that I was just not feeling, you know, this this part of my life. I wasn't feeding my soul. And because of that, um, a good friend of mine, Jane Eugene, was a brilliant singer, still is, of a group called Loose Ends, a uh, uh, fantastic group from the 80s and the 90s um, uh, from, from, uh, from, from the UK. She, she told me, she said, you're going to have to do something because, you know, there's a hole in your heart and I can see it. And that kind of led me to quit, you know, that job as an educator and, and start learning. I had to learn how to write novels. I was about in 2008 and it took me nearly, I don't know, maybe about eight years to really get it down. And, and that's when I won the, uh, the award for my novel. Your distinction is being the first African-American to win the Bram Stoker Award for uh, Superior Achievement, particularly in, with your young adult novel entitled Owari Mosaic. Now, for those who don't are not familiar, Bram Stoker was actually the author of Dracula. Yeah. Um, he basically, um, this award recognizes excellence in horror writing and you being the first African-American to receive recognition of this award is an achievement in itself in terms of what uh, drove you to particularly write horror. I mean, you know, um, what was it that led you to this genre of writing particularly? Listen. You know, I used to watch horror flicks with my father and my sister all the time. And I just, I loved horror. I mean, and I used to play video games all the time. Resident Evil, when it first came out, the zombie video game. And uh, I, so I just love the horror and the science fiction. You know, I love those genres. So it wasn't really, you know, and I guess I have a creepy mind, like just creepy ideas, you know, the type of things that I think of, you know, wouldn't necessarily work for a children's book, you know. So um, that's pretty much what led me. But um, the first African-American to win a Bram Stoker, which is, I'm still blown away. It's the most prestigious award in the world for horror writers, you know, to give you kind of like a, a, you know, comparison. It's like a Grammy for singers or like an Academy Award for, you know, actors or Emmy for TV actors. And Linda D. Addison was the first. She's now like a five time Bram Stoker winner. She's the first winner. And. You know, when I met her, she had this bigger than life personality. She kind of took me under her wing and, you know, um, embraced me under the Horror Writers Association, along with a lot of people, uh, Alexand uh, Alexander Sokoloff and, and just a lot of people that were wonderful to me. And, you know, so I was the first to win it in the novel category, the first black to win it in the novel category. And I didn't know that till about a year after when I saw argument on Twitter you know, when someone was arguing about, you mean no black people have won it in this category? And one of, one of the publishers that I'm very cool with, uh, you know, argued with the other person saying, actually, Nzandi won it. And he tagged me on it. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm the, are you kidding me? I'm the first black 
to win it in the novel? What? No one told me. It was uh, it was shocking. It was just an incredible honor. It still is. It's an amazing honor. And so, you know, in addition to being a writer, you also moved into the area of film and uh, a different type of film. You know, a lot of us just look at acting um, in terms of being in front of the camera, but your distinctions actually has been really supporting other actors. So tell us about what you do as an actor. The term is I'm a, I'm a stand in. Um, and we have an additional term that really helps people understand it. We're, we're rehearsal actors, kind of like stuntmen, but we don't do the stunts. So we back basically do all the setup, the lighting. We, we're there. We do the rehearsals. The groups that I'm usually with learns the lines right away. We learn the lines, not like an actor, but we learn the lines for the timing. So the cameraman can kind of work on the different movements, like if it's movement in the scene and whatnot. And, uh, you know, so we do all of that. We rehearse, we're rehearsal actors, we do all of that. And once we're done and, they, and they're ready and the lighting is perfect and the camera knows what they're gonna do and, you know, everyone's ready to go, the sound guys are ready to go, they bring the actors in and they film the, the, the shot. So we're rehearsal actors or stand-ins. So that's what I do, I love it. And it also gives me a time, you know, it gives me enough time to be able on, the, you know, while everyone else is kind of like, uh, I don't know, watching the scene. I'm writing mm -hmm. in my books, writing, you know, or reading or something like that in my downtime. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, we knew that there was a strike that um, it was, the, even though the writers were on strike at least a month or so or two months before, but on July 14th, or at least recent July, okay, I believe the Screen Actors Guild, SAG, as well as AFTRA also began to strike as well. Um, and that meant a lot of actors and people in the industry like yourself who are mm -hmm. behind the scenes, but do things. And I understand um, that that includes a lot of people, but let's start talking about the why. Why did SAG and AFTRA decide to strike? And what is up, but what is the concerns? What are the major concerns? The writers went on strike first before SAG after. So when the writers went on strike, that actually pretty much shut down the industry. Um, so we've been shut down for over three months now, over three months, and it was slowing down before that actually. So here's the, here's the why the writers went on strike as well as SAG after. Number one, the main reason is um, that we have a brand new industry. And the brand new industry, um, are, when I say brand new, I mean it's new in regards to the last, you know, 30, 40 years of television and film that we've, you know, worked under as far as the contracts. And that industry is streaming services. So basically with regular television, most TV shows, and when I say regular television, I mean like the major networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, most of those network shows had anywhere between 18 to 24 episodes per season. It was normal, 18, 24 per season, unless it was a limited series, I'm not even counting those. Regular TV shows, 18 to 24 episodes. Imagine if you're a writer and you're getting paid for 18 to 24 episodes, right? And that's how you make your livelihood. And usually those episodes, they, they, they take anywhere from uh, seven to 10 days, maybe even sometimes two weeks to shoot. So that basically means if you start in September, you finish somewhere somewhere around March. So that's seven, eight months, you know, that's pretty much a year of shooting. And then you might try to find a job in, in the summer, a short job, you know, some pilots or something like that. And you go back to work in September. Imagine the streaming services, a lot, the majority of those services those shows only last anywhere from six, eight, 10 episodes. So now you're talking about 24 episodes broken to less than half, not even 12, to less than half. That affects how much money you make, that affects your livelihood, that affects your health benefits. In our industry, you get health benefits based on the number of days you work. So if you don't work the dates, you don't get the benefits. 
And they do have certain tiers, but if you don't work today, now you don't have any medical, health, vision, you don't have any of that. So that's very important. So when the streaming services came on, on board, it really affected the writers very heavily. They weren't able to make, they weren't able to pay their bills basically, you know, um, and, and now they're trying to find other gigs and whatnot, or other jobs, and it, it wasn't exactly working out. It's not as stable as having a, you know, you, uh, 18, 24 episode. That's part of it. The second part of it is anytime you get new media, like there'll be a day when um, there'll be a day when it'll be very common that we'll watch movies in holograms. We'll have a hologram room. I'm pretty sure there'll be a day when we'll watch movies in a room and it'll be hologram. We'll go to concerts and all the concerts or a lot of the concerts will be holograms. Tupac, Michael Jackson, Elvis, Madonna, they'll all be holograms. New media. Well, with this new media and AI going on the rise, I can't even believe this. There is a stipulation that the AM, the AMPTP, which is the organization that basically represents these networks and executives and whatnot, or the union that rep, or, or yeah, the organization that represents them, actually had where, you know, for background, background or extras, for example, they could just use them for one day, right? And then AI them for the rest of the, the show or shows. So now you're putting thousands and thousands of extras out of work if they can just use their likeness for one day. If you saw the show on Netflix called Black Mirror, the very first episode of this season called Joan is Awful, starring Salma Hayek, it was almost like that was prophetic. That episode shows how far, it's a little bit more supernatural, but how far what we're, what we're dealing with. So imagine, you know, taking the likeness of Denzel Washington and you just, you, you, just, you just need him for one show. You just need him for one episode. So now you just pay him for that one episode. And then you can do, you know, you can just use AI to have them for the rest of the season on multiple seasons. So that cuts into your residuals. That cuts into your livelihood. That cuts into your, your salary, how much you, you, you're making, everything. So it's a big, big deal. And we have to stand up to this. And we have to, his, we have to make history and make a change so that we protect the industry because it affects everyone from the cameramen to the stand-ins, to the sound department, to hair and makeup, it affects everyone. So this is a big, this is what we're going through right now. It's great that the quote unquote, the big ticket um, actors and actresses who are coming in, which not too many of them are out there, are, are really standing up for their brother and sisters who are not making the same amount. And I think that this is important. I think it's important and I appreciate you sharing this because uh, people need to understand why people are, are striking. A lot of them are thinking, oh, well, I can't see my show. A lot of people uh, waiting patiently for some of these, I call soap operas, uh, to come back on and realizing that they're not coming on because the writers are on strike because and now the actors are on strike and, and, and basically, I think that's really going to get the attention of people when they realize that certain shows are not coming on as frequently. Um, now, um, I know there are certain entities that write, I know, I'm sure, uh, and I don't want to use the names, but, you know, there's some people in the industry who write their content for their shows, so they don't really have to worry because they do everything. But the majority of people don't, and certainly actors and actresses and and people in the industry. And talk about in some of the different um, crafts, like you are a person who supports the acting, but you're still part of SAG. There are a lot of other people who are in the industry who are not on stage. You don't see them, but they are part of these in unions. Um, so I, I, I'm wondering about how long, you, we were talking off stage, off mic about the fact that where the streaming services can wait and wait longer because of the industry. Yep. So they can continue this until next year because they have enough content to fill. But they're, you know, so it's a very strange situation. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I do, I mean, okay. I can see I can see a lot of people saying boo hoo hoo, you know, um, you all of you high high paying glamorous actors are out for a few months. You know, I'm working day to day, you know, with my blue collar, white collar job, you know, and uh, you, you're finally, you know, I, I'm working every day and I don't complain with my conditions. 
I need to put it a little bit more in perspective. So, and I'll just throw some numbers out there. They're not realistic. They're not uh, accurate numbers, but they're, you know, just kind of like, a, uh, just give you an idea. Say, for example, there are 2,000 actors. There are 2,000 actors currently working. I, I, I don't know if it's more than that or less. Out of those 2,000 actors, there are probably about 100 of them that are the high paying, you know, you know, well-to-do actors. Everyone else are, you know, working actors, right? And basically, what is a working actor? A working actor is someone who you might see on this show. You know, it's what we call day playing. So he plays a character on this show, maybe one or two episodes. Then you might see him three times, three more times that year on this show, on that show, and on this show. Oh, he's doing great. We saw him four times on four different shows. So to put it in perspective, and I don't want to throw anyone in the bus, but I'll just throw out just a, a, a number. They may make for that, that episode, unless they're like a big star, they may make anywhere from, and I'm not, it's not an accurate number, just give you an idea. I don't want to tell the exact numbers. Anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000 that episode. Okay. So if they work two days for that show, right, that's 4,000. And they did four shows. They made 16,000, 20,000 for that year, right? They barely made enough money to get their health benefit. So this is the majority of the actors. You might think that it's really glamorous, but they only did four. The, the actors that are doing great, that are doing six, 10, 12 shows, or that, that are, you know, regular day players on a show, that's cool. But most of the actors, they're doing one or two days here, one or two days here, three months later. One, so three months later, I mean, they only made 4000 for the three months. How do you, you know, so it's a tough industry. And not only that, the majority of actors, even the ones that have this wonderful shows and they're the lead of the show, if they get another show, another two shows in their career, that's excellent. But a lot of actors are only known for one show. You know, Gilligan. They're only known for one show. He was on two shows, Dobie Gillis. After that show, which only lasted three or four years, the rest of his career is, hey, I'm Gilligan. But he's not making that same money day to day. So it's a glamorous life, but it's a tough life. And so we're fighting for just our rights to make the type of money that we deserve. They're already cutting down the times, of ep the episodes per season, and they're cutting down residuals because it's a different format. Think about this. The residuals that could be based on, you know, your show being show, your, your show playing, you know, you know, plays on this this TV, this TV network today. And now it's playing, the, you know, the rerun is playing on this network, playing on that network. And you're getting residuals from every time it's playing on that network. It's a little bit different when it's, you know, they put the whole show, this whole season, they, they release it one day. And so it's forever on this thing. It's not like it's being played on this network and you get residuals. So it's a whole different setup because it's already on there and you're not getting the same kind of money. There are a lot of top actors that are getting residuals that are less than a dollar. People may not understand what residual is. You mean income per show. Anytime it's being shown, you get a certain amount of money, right? Yes. So they have, let's say, Good Times, for example, which is a show back in the 70s, 80s. 80s. Uh, those actors, some of them haven't worked since. Uh, you know, good times were able to get maybe residuals. And I know some actors who used to brag that they had residual income, but you're saying now they may not be getting anything or less than nothing based on what's happening, correct? Yeah, because the the net the streaming services are releasing the entire season in perpetuity on that, you know, you can go to it any time and watch it. So it's not like it's being shown mm -hmm. next Monday. You can watch it at any time of the day. So the pay scale is different. I just want to make sure the audience understood what was that, yeah. you know, because a lot of people, as I said, I've known some actors who I haven't seen work since, you know, whatever, but they depend. I mean, the one actress in particular was bragging that she was looking forward to residual income. This was about 10 years ago. Yeah. Now with the, with the new format of things, I'm sure this person is not 
making that type of money at all because of the new format of shows. The streaming has really made major changes. So, you know, I really appreciate, uh, Ace, you, you clarifying because a lot of people are not sure. Not an expert in this in this topic at all. So if, if I'm mistaken in any regard on any other things, I'm open and I'm totally welcome to be corrected mm -hmm. on that just due to my knowledge of what I have on the topic. Mm -hmm. so. No, and I appreciate that. And certainly, you know, I think I wanted our audience to be familiar because sometimes we hear things in the media and we don't know how does it deal with. And there's a lot of people in our community who've been on these sitcoms. But, you know, when I think about the amount of sitcoms there were back in the 70s and 80s and yeah. a lot of people, that's all they did. They did that one or two shows and that's it. For their career. Uh, so, you know, that's going to impact a lot of people who are now seniors and so forth. Um, so so this is something, particularly for those of us interested in theater and, and, and not theater, but uh, in uh, careers in television and uh, in movies and how that is impacting the actor, the, 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 the creative artist like yourself who's working in the industry. Well, I just want to take this opportunity to say, gosh, the time just goes. Uh, but I, I really want to sincerely thank you for joining us, uh, sharing. Um, I know that there's so much more to talk about. Um, certainly, we're still uh, celebrating the life of your dad and many others from the age as years. But I also wanted people to know your work as a creative artist, continuing the legacy, doing some wonderful work in the industry and more to come. Um, more to but I certainly take this opportunity <clears throat> to, if somebody wants to talk to you or contact you, is there a contact email or number that someone, if they want to contact you personally? Yeah, you can go to my contact page on my website, which is A as in Apple, Antonio Hall, aantoniohall.com. And you can go to the contact page, page and uh, you can reach me there. Or you can, uh, you know, hit me up on uh, my Instagram. I'm, I'm on my Instagram a lot under, uh, what is it? It's uh, Inzandi underscore Ace underscore of underscore horror. And Inzandi spelled N as in Nancy, Z as in Zoo, O, N as in Nancy, D as in David, I. Inzandi, Ace of Horror, in between each word, underscores. I want to sincerely thank you, Ace. Zandi for being, being with us and again, continue the great work. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this broadcast and we continue to encourage you to tune in, to write and to tell a friend, but please visit our website at www.ccptv.org. But until next time, Louise Dente saying thank you. Thank you.